starting a new series. Um, last last month, the uh, pastor was talking about miracles, and he closed off that series, and Chuck was talking about the long call, finishing well, and that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm kind of going to build on that a little bit. It was kind of interesting that that's where they touched on, because a lot of my series is actually going to be referring to things that they talked about that I didn't know that they were going to be talking about. So, uh, y- you know, uh, every every year at Christmas time, um, you know, I watch the Christmas movies, and we have a rule that we can't watch the Christmas movies at any other time except for in December. So one of the years, one of the movies that we always watch, uh, it's called It's a Wonderful Life. It's kind of an older movie, but I think it's one of the better Christmas movies. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I grew up with it. It, it really is. Uh, it, it's a lot better than Barbie Christmas. <laughs> uh, but there's a part on It's a Wonderful Life. Can you tell that I have uh, that I have uh, toddler girls? <laughs> um, there's a part on It's a Wonderful Life where the main character, his name is, just, his name is George Bailey, and he says this thing. <laughs> I'm sure you guys remember being this young once. He says, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day and the year after that. He says it's towards the beginning of the movie. He's getting ready to take off to college and to travel around, travel around Europe and all this different stuff. And he's got everything planned out, and he knows exactly what he's going to do. Well, if you've ever seen the movie, you know that things start falling apart instantly. His dad dies, so he cancels his trip to Europe to take care of the business, and then he's almost walking out to go to college, and they say, we're going to go with Mr. Potter, the big bad man, if you don't, if you don't stay. So it z- does the old movie thing, you know, where it zooms in on his face. You know, you know the thing I'm talking about. Every old movie has it. Uh, if you've ever seen a Jimmy Stewart movie, you know that he's a fan of this one. Come on, it's, uh, I don't know, it's just something they did in old movies, I don't know why. And, uh, but anyway, so then, you know, he doesn't get to go to college, and then he waits for his brother to get out of college, and he pays for his brother to go to college so that he can come back and run the business, and he can finally get out of this town that he hates, this town that he hates so, so much. And his brother comes, comes back, surprise, surprise, married, with a job somewhere else. And uh, George Bailey is just like, no, I'm going to be stuck here forever. So in a fit of rage, he gets married, <laughs> which I think is the funny part of the movie. <laughs> he goes and, and huffs and puffs and gets married. It's like, well, I would have waited till you calm down on that one, but whatever. Uh, you know, and then he gets stuck in this town. And a long story short, his, his, his uncle uh, loses some money. And uh, uh, so he he's, you know, gets in all this trouble. But uh, more of the story being what I, what I was kind of building on is the fact that, you know, he knew all of what he, he, he knew how his life was going to go. He had it all planned out. And nothing that he says are his plans actually happen. There's not one thing that he planned for his life to happen that actually did happen. And uh, <laughs> that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. You know, when I was a kid, I felt the same way. You know, I, I would change the world single-handedly. You know, I knew everything that, I, that, that needed to be done, and I was the right person to do it, and I just was smarter than everybody else. And uh, so I, I just kind of knew exactly, you know, what would happen, when it would happen, and I just had my life planned out. Well, <laughs> life doesn't really follow plans too well. <laughs> I'm sure everyone here has felt like that before. Uh, if you look back on your life, you can see it as a series of, uh, I wanted that to happen, and this is what actually happened. <laughs> um, and for a girl... 2,000 years ago, that's actually exactly uh, what happened when God did a miracle. A lot of times we think when God does a miracle that that somehow is going to make it where, um, you know, all of our dreams come true and that kind of, like on Napoleon Dynamite, if you vote for me, all your wildest dreams will come true, you know, and we think that's kind of what's going to happen with God, you know. Um, He's going to do this miracle and all my dreams are going to come true. Well, for a little girl 2,000 years ago, that's not exactly what happened. Um, it says in Luke one twenty six through 38, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pre- uh, pregnancy, which for this story you don't need to know who Elizabeth is. If you're curious, just go and read Luke. Uh, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, which is in uh, the Middle East, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Now, when they use words like descendant, it, it doesn't necessarily mean child of, more like predecessor. Think of it like over a span of time. So, for instance, my son Micah could be called, you know, my dad's son in that context. Uh, that's how they wrote back then. I don't, I don't know why they did that. They just did that. 
Uh, okay, so the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is, uh, is with you. Now, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. You know, when I read that, it makes me think of, you know, when your kids come up to you and they say, I love you, and it's like, what do you want? <laughs> you know, I kind of I have a feeling that that's kind of what's going on with Mary. Like, okay, an angel just appears to me and says, I'm favored. What do you want, buddy? Uh, Mary was greatly troubled. I wonder what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Once again, not meaning his immediate father. It's David lived hundreds of years before him. Uh, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One, uh, I'm sorry, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. So then the angel left her. Now, I know that we're out of Christmas, so we're never supposed to talk about Jesus' birth again. <laughs> but there are some very interesting things that I really want to point out. See, we read this story, and, you know, it's, it's a fun little story. Okay, whatever, let's save it for December. You know, but there's some things in this story that, that I feel like we kind of just miss over or skip over. Um, but before I get going, I get answered this question quite a bit. Um, it is a little bit hard to understand. Uh, people typically ask me, well, hold on, so God had sex with Mary? Well, so before we even get going, let's just kind of look at that. Um, when it says, where is it? Will come on you. Um, it's talking about a miracle happening. So there was really no physical father. The Holy Spirit caused a baby, Jesus, as a baby, I should say, to appear in her womb where there wasn't a baby. Now, the next question that people ask me, which, yes, people do ask me this, so if, if you didn't have this question, let me answer it anyways. Um, did God use one of Mary's eggs or no? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't say that. All that we know is that the Holy Spirit caused Jesus to appear in her womb as a baby. Okay, so just clarifying that. No, God did not have sex with Mary. So, uh, Right. Okay, so a few things. And I feel like this is one thing that we really uh, overlook. Mary never saw the full fulfillment. Mary never saw the full fulfillment. So God gives her these plans that he has, and she never sees them fulfilled. She sees, instead, she sees her son betrayed and humiliated, and then she sees him resurrected in power, but still, even after her resurrection, she never sees these things. Look, uh, let's look at some of these things. Look, uh, Holy One to be born will be called the Son, the son of God. Uh, she, heard, she heard him called a lot of things. I don't know if she ever lived to see, uh, hear him called that, but then it says, um, where is it? I think it's in this verse here. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. She lived to see his death. And then she saw his resurrection and still no ruling. So she had a plan, or God had this plan that, that he gave to her that she never even saw fulfilled. So I think that that's kind of a big deal. And I'll come back to that in just a second. But then there's a few other things I want to look at before we really get going on this. And I feel like this is one of the biggest issues that people overlook. Israel was an honor-shame society. Now what that means is everything you did reflected on your, on your family's name. It reflected on, their, on your family's reputation. Um, and one of the worst things you could do was ruining your family's name. So with that in mind, now you might say it couldn't have been that, that big of a deal. It was to this deal that a lot of people actually killed themselves because they, they brought shame to their family. So imagine this, this giant thing that even if you didn't care, your entire culture and your family did care. 
So it wasn't something you could just shrug off. We don't really have that too much nowadays, especially here, um, but in other places in the world they do. So let's look at a few of these things as to how this applies to, to, to this passage. First off, Mary got pregnant out of marriage, which, once again, nowadays in Tularosa isn't really that big of a deal. There's a lot of teenagers who do this, but back then this was a huge embarrassment, embarrassment for her and actually for everybody involved. This would have been something that shamed her, and uh, it would have made the entire community look down on her, and it would have ruined her future in a word, or in a phrase, I guess I should say. Um, and, and can you just imagine what people must have said? The, the baby's from God. Sure, God did it. And then later, uh, her and Joseph run to Egypt, Sure, God told you to go to Egypt. You're just running away from your problems. You can just kind of you you can just kind of anticipate people saying that, can't you? If you've ever had people gossip against you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but here's here's another little thing. Here is the family was 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 responsible for protecting her and for raising her and for keeping her pure. In fact, if you read in Song of Solomon, it talks about the way that if our sister. Uh, is, you know, is honorable, will give her freedom there towards the end of the book. But if she's, I think it refers to her as being a door or something like that, um, we, will, we will lock her away and, and, and take away her freedom and liberty. You know, it was this whole idea of, of you know, it's our responsibility to, to keep her pure. And uh, also young virgins were more valuable um, in, the, in the dowry system. Uh, Non-virgins were kind of seen as spoiled goods. Um, which I, and once again, nowadays we kind of miss out on a, lot that, on a lot of that, but back then this was a really big issue. God wasn't simply saying, hey, I'm going to bless you and everything's going to be fine. He said, I'm going to submit you to shame. Everybody's going to be talking against you. The whole community is going to look down on you. Your own family is going to think that this was not for me. And in fact, Jesus' own brothers didn't believe that he was Jesus. So, or, I'm sorry, the Christ, the God, you know. Um, so this is kind of a big deal. In fact, back then, they, the, the virgins had a higher dowry. So if your, vir- if your daughter wasn't a virgin, you couldn't ask for as much for her when she got married. And in fact, people don't realize this too much either. If you got married to a girl and it turned out that she wasn't a virgin, you could actually get your dowry money back and divorce her, and it was totally acceptable at the time. So, so, I mean, this is, this is a, big, a big deal that, that God is asking for her to do. It's not something that should simply be shrugged off. So now let's go to Jesus. How would this affect Jesus? Well, first off, he'd be seen as an illegitimate child. Jesus would be known uh, as a shamed individual his whole life, even though he did nothing wrong. And, you know, this actually continues on to today. You know, if, if there's somebody who's in an immoral relationship and they have a kid, Oftentimes, we look down on the kid, even though the kid had nothing to do with it. I mean, all that they did is they were born, but we still, you know, look down on them. So now, imagine if you were in this honor-shame society, and there's this kid born, you know, oh, uh, that, that prostitute Mary, you know, and then they look down on the kid when the kid didn't even do anything wrong. So this affects Jesus and his ministry, you know, and, and in fact, there's a part where Jesus goes back to his town, and they say, isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? You know, that guy that we've been talking about for the past 30 years, isn't this him? But that's not it. You see, it would also shame Joseph, Mary's, well, at this time, soon-to-be husband, but Mary's eventual husband, because to be with a prostitute was not really that great of a thing. In fact, there's a prophet uh, in the Old Testament, his name was Hosea, that uh, God actually told him to marry a prostitute. Uh, You know, this is something that that would shame Joseph, because, oh, well, you're with that woman, you know, that... Can you imagine trying to explain that to, to, your, to the in-laws? Mom, look, Mary really is a nice, n- nice girl, I promise. Oh, she's just a trollop, a prostitute. And it's like, Mom, hold on. <laughs> it's not like that. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I find these things a little bit funnier now that, uh, now that I'm already married. Uh, I remember when I, was, uh, when I was still in the dating game. Oh, boy. I'm so glad I don't have to do that nonsense anymore. Oh, my... Uh, anyways, uh, and even if uh, they didn't see Mary as a prostitute, they still would have seen Joseph as a person who took advantage of Mary. Either Mary had sex with other guys or Joseph just took advantage of her. Either way, this doesn't look good for Joseph. So we're talking about mass, uh, mass uh, gossip, mass shame. 
it's an easy choice for us because we see the end game and we don't have to make the choice. But for them, for them, this was a very hard path to walk. This is a very difficult thing to do. This young lady, she was somewhere in her teens. She threw away her entire future for this plan, this promise from God that she never saw fulfilled. Have you ever, have you ever tried to obey God and you think, man, oh man, when is this? I, I'm, Pastor talked about this this morning. I'm praying for this, God. When, when are you going to answer this? We're talking about not praying for something and waiting for an answer, like there was a good time and then it was gone. We're talking about from the moment she was, she was not even married. She was just becoming a woman and her whole life was thrown away for this thing that God had planned. So if we just focus on all that she had to give up, that sounds kind of terrible. But it, if you look at the bigger picture, though, their shame fulfilled God's purpose. Paul says it somewhere in the New Testament like this. The things that we're going through now aren't even comparable to the things that are in heaven. And this thing that, that Mary had to do of, of, of shaming herself and her whole family and, and, and her parents and all that, it was for a bigger purpose. I mean, aren't, aren't you glad that Jesus was born? See, we, thousands of years later, are blessed by her sacrifice. Now, my purpose isn't to glorify uh, Mary. That's not my purpose at all. But sometimes in life, you're going to go through things like people gossiping about you, people shaming you. You're going to lose your identity. And that's exactly what happened with Mary. Um, to have done this, she would have lost her family identity. And to lose your family identity, you would lose your identity. Um, People wouldn't respect her. She would be put in danger, as we see uh, in the story later on. People, uh, Herod's men, for instance, chasing them down. And then imagine this. Now, some of us had the unfortunate tragedy to outlive some of our children. Um, but for Mary, her child was born for the purpose of dying. Try to, ima- try to wrap your head around, as a parent, how difficult that must have been. So I'm going to go through all this shame. The people in the community are going to look at I'm never going to have a home again. All so that my child can die? That sounds like a lose, lose, lose. That does not sound good. You know, and yet, that's not Mary's heart. Let, let's look at her last words and all of this. Wow. And the Lord's servant, may, uh, may your word to me be fulfilled. I'm actually going to read it in the ESV because I like, I think it's, I think it's the ESV that I'm thinking of. It says in, in there in verse 28. I mean 38, sorry. No, it's about the same thing. I don't remember which version I was looking at, so I'm just going to skip past it. But uh, she just has this heart of, okay, God. And see, that's, that's the amazing thing about this whole story. Women were not really, uh, in, in the Jewish eyes, in Greeks and Romans' eyes, it, was, it wasn't so bad. But in Jewish eyes, women weren't exactly the most reliable people. They were kind of looked down on. They, they weren't property. That, that's an overstatement. But they just didn't have the same. If I was going to court, I wouldn't ask a woman to testify. I would ask a man to testify, and it would be more respectable to do that. But in the New Testament, you see God over and over again using women to do this great thing. They were the first proclaimers of the gospel. And I just, it just amazes me that God would, look and would use people who, who, who people look down on. And he asked them for a purpose to be looked down on. And it kind of kind of opens some opens my eyes when he's talking about the Beatitudes and says, talking about, you know, blessed are you when this happens because of this. You know, Joseph actually, I mean, Jesus actually knew what he was talking about. This is him 30 years after. He's been looked down on his whole life, more than likely in his in his hometown community because he's, you know, the illegitimate child. His mom's been looked down on, you know, for his whole life at least. 
And, uh, you know, he says, hey, blessed are you in this because of, and it just, you know, w- when you start to see the perspective in it, it starts to really make the words seem a little bit more. You know, Jesus wasn't just saying empty words. He was saying something that he had gone through. And this is actually what Hebrews talks about, that he went through trials like us. And if you notice, though, in, in, in Luke, the Bible really downplays what Mary had to, had to go through through this. And if, if you just stop and wonder why, it's because the rewards outweighed the cost. The rewards outweighed the cost. So let's just wrap a few of these things up. First off, things aren't always how they seem. Be careful when you're judging people. Remember that in Jesus' day, people missed the Messiah because of their own bias. And part of that bias that they missed was this couldn't be Jesus. He's just that illegitimate child. Imagine this, the creator of the universe, and you're calling him an illegitimate child. I mean, that's just, (laughs) goodness sakes. And uh, another thing, living for God costs a lot. It is a hard thing to do, but the rewards are greater. And even if we think everyone is against us, when we obey God, heaven stands with us. See, Sometimes when we obey God, we're called to a place of being shamed. We're called to a place of people looking down on us. But there's always more for us than there are against us. Let's say the entire community turns its back on us. People don't even come to this church just because they know, oh, that's where Michael is. Let's go anywhere else but there. And, uh, you know, even if that, that were the case, everybody is against you. Remember that we're not, we're not alone. In fact, in 2 Kings chapter 6, there's a story where this army surrounds this prophet, and the prophet's servant says, oh, dang, there's this huge army out there. Things are not looking good. And and the prophet says this, God opened his eyes, and he sends them back out, and the hills are covered with the angels of the Lord. And he says, greater are those who are with us than those who are against us. When you do God's work, you don't have to worry about... And when I'm talking about doing God's work, I'm talking about living, living, for, living for Him. You know, sometimes at work, you'll be better off if you don't live for God. It's easier to get ahead in the business world if you don't follow God's principles. Just do your own thing. Your money is your own. Spend your own time however you want. And then you can get all kinds of wealth and all kinds of happiness. Oh, well, not happiness, but all kinds of wealth. And, man, you'll be really set. You see what I'm saying? God knows what you're going through, and although obeying God sometimes costs more than you can give, God will always walk with you through it. Sometimes he'll ask you to stay faithful to someone who's not faithful. Sometimes he'll ask you to encourage people who hate you. Sometimes he'll ask you to stand up for the weak when you don't really feel like you're all that what's-my-opinion matter. But in all these things, remember that the reward outweighs the cost, even if God calls you to a place where you are openly shamed and looked down upon. And even if, even if you never get to justify yourself and, you know, prove that you're right, which, by the way, never try and argue your point from Facebook. It's better to just let people talk about you. I mean, that's really, take it from me. You don't, don't just, just let people talk about you, and, and it'll be okay. But, uh, you know, in all these things, Even if God calls you to a place where you're shamed, you keep your eyes on God, and you just keep going forward. It may be inconvenient, but when God changes our plans, our life plans, our our, our big things that we had all planned out, He uses it to bless others. And isn't that what we're here for anyways? We're here to restore people to God, right? We're not just living for ourselves. When we get to heaven, we won't be there for five seconds And all the nonsense that we wasted our time on will just, it'll be gone. It won't matter. And maybe you're like me, where it's at this point that you say something along the lines of this, but I don't want to help others or have struggles. I just want to live my life. That's exactly why God changes our plans. Because we naturally gravitate to doing life our way on our terms. 
God changes our plans so that we can reach out to others and help people up. It would have been easier for Mary, more convenient for Mary. It would have been better for her family, for Joseph, for Jesus, had none of these things ever happened. But yet, it would have been worse for all of us. See what I mean? Sometimes God, God's going to ask you more than you feel like you can give. It's okay to be overwhelmed. You just keep going. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing in our community. Help us to not become, not to see things as hopeless. And God, help us to see that you are positioning us in a place where we can better serve others so that we don't waste our life on ourselves. And even though we kick and scream and, and holler about it, God, we know that in the long run, your way is better. God, forgive us for our arrogance of trying to live life on our own terms, of thinking that it's our time, our money, when everything that we have is a gift from you. God, if you call us to shame, help us to, shame, to bear that shame well. If you call us to pain, help us, help us to carry that pain well. If you call us to loss, help us to bear that loss well. Lord, and if you call us to hopelessness, let us encourage the hopeless. That no pain and no tragedy would ever be pointless. So as you continue to change our plans like you always do, God, help us to learn as a servant rather than demand as a king. And in all these things, Lord, be glorified.